because a big change happened at his estate from an agricultural standpoint. In the 1760s, Washington was still growing tobacco. That was his cash crop. It's really the crop that made Virginia wealthy. But the land here was very exhausted from the growth of tobacco. It's very hard on the soil, it sucks a lot of nutrients out of it. So what Washington realized was if he continues in tobacco, he's going to be into debt. So he made a big change in 1766 and converted his farms from growing tobacco to growing cereal grains, with the most important one being wheat. And he knew with wheat he could manufacture that into flour and export it to a variety of areas uh, in the Caribbean, South America, and even back to Europe. The other nice thing about being in wheat as opposed to tobacco was tobacco was an enumerated good that was controlled by the British Crown. So as a colonial plantation owner, you had to ship all your tobacco to England where it was inspected, it was graded, and they would basically tell you the value of that. For Washington, he has a lot more economic independence with wheat because he can manufacture it into flour and his new mill and export it to wherever the market needs it. And for most American mills, as early as the 1680s, the Caribbean islands were a real destination for flour and cornmeal. Those were sugar islands and they needed foodstuffs. So once we had a surplus of grain in the colonies, mills from New England all the way down to the Carolinas were looking for a market for that grain, the excess grain, and that became Barbados and other islands in the Caribbean. Washington grows up with this knowledge. I mean, he took a trip to Barbados as a teenager. He understood the markets there. And this switch from tobacco to wheat was critical to economic viability for the estate. So he built a, a mill here on Dove Run Farm. And we are right now about three miles from the mansion. And if you visit Mount Vernon today, and you drive from the mansion to the estate or vice versa, you pass through all these wonderful neighborhoods. Well, in Washington's time, those were all his farms. He had 8,000 acres in total, uh, about 12 miles of waterfront. And out here at Dove Run Farm, he built a mill because the water from the creek, the Dove Creek was here to supply that power needed to run a water wheel. So in, in 1770, he constructed a mill dam and a pond two miles above the mill. And gradually that flowed down a long mill race, race which is like an earthen canal that brought the water into the building through a wooden box called the flume to run a, a large water wheel to power millstones. And Washington's mill that we've reconstructed here is set up just like his mill was in the 18th century with an inside water wheel and two sets of millstones. And one of the sets we have open today since we haven't been running. Uh, in fact, we've run once since uh, mid-March and that was to grind grits for our retail shops. But these stones here are actually from France. They're called French burr stones and they were the highest quality millstone in the world at the time. Uh, they've been quarried since the 13th century in Europe and used in mills throughout Europe. They're freshwater quartz, and they became well-known in the colonies for making the best white flour. And Washington, when he built the mill, bought a set of these, and he paid a pretty good price for them. They were expensive, but he knew this would do what he needed done to make that high-quality flour. So we run these, not as often as the other stones, but we run these uh, throughout the year, and we make that fine flour that he did and tell the story of uh, how he exported that flour. Um, now, if you look at the stone, you can see the grooves in it. Those are called furrows. The top stone is facing downwards now, but they, it has furrows as well. So when you put the two stones together, it works a lot like scissors with the top stone, which rotates. The bottom stone is stationary. The grain will flow through the stones and be ground into meal. And this is something you don't normally see on tour. If you look down here and see this little rectangular hole, that's where all the meal cycles around and goes down a chute. So gravity is your friend in a mill like this. It's going to take that flour downstairs for us automatically. Now, obviously, running stones like this, they can't run open. Um, they have to have some way to collect all that meal and also to feed the grain in. So if we step over and take a look at the country stones, as they're called, this has all the mill furniture on it. Uh, that's all the wooden parts. So uh, not to get too technical, but you have a casing or a ton, the horse frame, Underneath here, this little tray is called the shoe, and on top is the hopper. Most people are familiar with the phrase, throw one in the hopper. Well, it really starts with the old mills. And I've got white corn in here right now, which is a high-grade food white corn that we make our grits out of. Um, one other piece you might see down in the middle is this shaft that runs through here. That's called the damsel. And when the mill's on, that damsel rotates with the stone, and it agitates the shoe. 
and helps that grain feed in. And when you look at all this, you think, wow, what amazing 18th century technology. The, the truth of the matter is the first written reference of a water mill is in a Greek text from 100 BC. Now, it didn't look exactly like this. A different design of wheels, horizontal, more simplistic. But through the ages, mills progressed. And so when you visit Mount Vernon, what you're seeing is a mill of the late 1790s, a very cutting edge mill that Washington made. But as a younger man, when he traveled through Virginia, the way it was an agrarian society, even though they grew tobacco, they had to eat, he would have passed mill after mill after mill growing up. So it was part of the landscape for anyone that lived back then. And don't forget, they did the same thing with wind power. There was a number of windmills throughout America and in Virginia. So all of this technology, and Washington was really very technical minded. I mean, he was a surveyor, he understood mathematics very well, and he loved this sort of technology. In fact, when the mill was being built, it was such a critical building to his changeover of his farms. If you look at his diaries in 1770, you'll see things listed like rid to the mill today, rid to the mill today, rid to the mill today. Sometimes three times a day he's on site. He's a very hands-on manager and he was wanted to work with the millwright, the man he hired to build the mill. He was a millwright was a traditional builder of mills and Washington was made, made sure he was there to oversee construction. Because if this building doesn't work right, his whole economic change from tobacco to wheat does not work right. So you see that throughout his life uh, management by being on top of things, being detail oriented and being in that space is often the way he did it. So uh, I think that's why he was successful at so many things. Um, so you'll notice this stone is up on the crane. Uh, you may have noticed that when I was over here. This stone weighs 2,700 pounds. The bottom stone about a ton. So we have to take them apart periodically to clean them. But also the grooves, the furrows in the stone have to be recut. You have to sharpen it. It's like any cutting tool. If these, these stones get dull, it's not going to make quality product. So this tool here, there are different designs, but this is a mill pick or a mill bill. And so you spend seven to eight hours on your knees, usually on a bag that has bran in it. They call it bist for padding for your knees. And you peck away at that stone and recutting and defining all those furrows. This stone, to do this, we'd have to jack the stone up all the way, and it'll pivot on these pins, and we'll flip it vertical, and then we'll flip it on its back and set it down so the grinding face is exposed, and then we would dress this set of stones. We do this usually every February to keep the mill really in good working order. In Washington's time, they had to do this every two to three months because there was just so many thousands of bushels going through the mill. Now you can see the wheel behind me, but I think what we're gonna do now is head downstairs, take a closer look at the gearing, and we are gonna run the mill a little bit for you today, which is actually uh, satisfying to me because I miss running the mill. As I said, Corey Welshans and I, my head miller, we've only run it once since mid-March. And it's also better for the machine to run. In actuality, what we say in the milling trade is if, if they rest, they rust. And so some people say we have to preserve the old machine by not running it so it might not break. You preserve it by running it and by taking care of it and doing maintenance to it. When mills or any, look at an old house that sits, you have to be active in it. And so this mills being a machine, that's very critical. So I'm going to head down the Miller stairs and uh, join you downstairs here and we'll continue this discussion. Hope you all can see me, hear me okay. Uh, we are in this old stone building. So I wanted to mention if we get a little video glitch or anything, that might happen. These walls are two and a half feet thick. Uh, uh, we, we're a unique 18th century mill that has Wi-Fi. So uh, because we, we do a lot of filming in here, etc. So you can see the gears back here behind me. And these are reconstruction, but these are all built 18th century, to 18th century accuracy. So I like to say if Washington walked in here, he would recognize his mill. Um, I'm going to step back in here and tell you a little bit about the gears because uh, on tour you don't often get some of these details. So let me just climb back here. I'm used to climbing around these machines. I've been doing it a long time. 
But you'll notice this, these gears have cogs, these teeth, and rounds. And so this is a way to transfer the power from the water wheel through a series of gears to run this spindle, which drives that millstone. But one thing, they, they really knew their mathematics back then. We don't give our forefathers enough credit because you don't want each cog in this gear or that gear to mesh in the same spot every time it rotates. It would cause uneven, improper wear. So they have what they call a hunting cog in that one gear has an odd number, the other an even number. So if you look at this slot here, call that slot number one, on the first rotation, a, a cog from that gear will hit that first slot. The next time around, it's going to be in the next slot and then the third slot. So that's called a hunting cog, and that way you get even wear of the gears. And after seven to eight to ten years, you replace them. Cogs and rounds come out, and then you can put the new ones in. So that's part of maintenance of an 18th century or a wooden geared mill. Um, let me climb back out of here and talk a little bit about the fact that mills are not just wood in the 18th century. In the 19th century, you'll see metal water wheels as, as technology changes, but they, they couldn't make completely iron gears in the 18th century. It was too costly. They didn't have the ability to cast pieces that large, but they needed bearings for the, the shafts to turn on. So if you come back a little deeper in here, you'll notice the water wheel shaft. This is a solid oak tree. It's about 21 feet long. So on the other side of that wall is a 16-foot water wheel, but in the end of the shaft is the bearing. And you can see the end that it turns on. It's hard to see, but there's actually part of the bearing fits up into the end of the shaft. So what I've got here is actually a bearing from the 1932 restoration of this mill. This piece is an artifact that's really from about 1819, from a mill that they brought here in 1932 when they did the first restoration here. And they brought parts of another old mill. So this is the winged gungeon. There you can see the end part, and you see the wings, and the iron bands are still on here. So when you fit that gudgeon, the wings, into the shaft, they would heat up and in real, real hot and get these bands on the end, cool them quickly, and it'll shrink onto the end of the shaft and hold that bearing in place. So this is one of the few old artifacts we have from the early restoration, and we usually have it on the table over here, but I think it's illustrative of you know, how those, the bearings will fit. And you'll see bands, there's gudgeons in the ends of all these other shafts. Now to look at the gear, we talked about the cogs. If you look at the arms of the gear, these arms go into the shaft. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a number of arms on that big gear. They look like they stop in the shaft. Well, they actually go all the way through to the other side. So they're one length of white oak. And they all interlock inside that shaft into a joint called a compass arm joint. And the reason for that is you want strength in that gear and you want it to lock in so it doesn't drift over time in and out. You want it to run true. And down here on the floor, our millwright, Gus Kjorpus, built this model for us so we can talk to visitors here about that. So this is what it looks like inside the center of that shaft, same on the water wheel side. So it, what's interesting is millwrights were so highly skilled. I always say they're, they're a carpenter times 10,000 in skill sets. So these all lock together, so if we were to pull that gear apart, you would have all these pieces that interlock to make that gear strong on the inside. That's a compass arm joint. And that's true of all the little cog gears in here in the big gear. They're all built that way. And again, when we think about our forefathers, maybe not knowing a whole lot, I knew a whole lot about many topics. They didn't always have the science to try to catch up to them, but they, they knew how to build things. So that's your compass arm joint. So let's go over here, not to call it the business end, the millstone's really the business end, but this is where the final product comes out of the mill. So the stones grind, remember that little rectangular hole I showed you upstairs? That meal or pancake flour or grits, whatever we're making, comes down the meal spout and into the sifter. And it's called a shaker sifter because it's going to kick back and forth. And if you look back into the gear pit, on top of that lantern pinion gear that looks like a birdcage, you'll see a block of wood. Kind of looks like a football. And as that rotates, it kicks an arm and causes this box to shake back and forth. 
sifting the meal. But to get the sifting done, you have screens that we insert. Now, people say when they're on tour, would they have screens like that? Well, they didn't have galvanized screen back then. But we make food product here. We have to follow certain regulations. Uh, what they would have had is a wire mesh or, or cloth called bolting silk that it would sift. So this one here I have because if you'll notice, there's a certain size mesh here, and then it gets wider in this section. This is how we make the grits. If you love our grits, that's how that's done. So this will fit in the box. Meal will drop through the first screen, grits through the second because they're coarser. And then you have one here that's all one, one sieve size. So all the other products run on that. Now, we are selling products right now, which is great for our Mount Vernon online store. And this is uh, our grits here. And these are uh, made right here in the mill on these millstones, high quality food grade grain from a farm uh, in Virginia. And, you know, as it says on the back, stone ground by water power. So please check out the retail store. Uh, there's, I think everything's in stock, including pancake flour and, and different meals. So, you know, if you need something at home to help, help with your, all the meals we're having to make in the current situation, get some, some of our product right there. Now, this screen will fit right up in the shaker. So it just pops in easily, easily. There it goes. Now, a couple things about the controls here on the mill, you'll notice this peg here with this leather strap. This is called a crook string. Where did that originate? I don't know. But that allows me to tighten the shoe up top, which is just below the hopper, so I can raise or lower the shoe and increase or decrease the amount of grain feeding into the stone. Um, there's a long lever. You can see the end of it here. Maybe if we can step around here for a minute, you'll see this end here. This allows me to raise or lower the top stone. Because if you can imagine the top stone rotating over the bottom, when I need to adjust the gap between them, depending on if I'm making a very fine product or a medium product or, or grits. So the top stone's adjustable with this compound lever. So it's the way it's designed with the compound lever principle. That's a 1,500 pound stone. I can move like that. And therefore, I can set the gap for whatever product we're making and control the quality. And the way the millers do that is by feel. And we've, those of us who run the mill have been at it a while. You can tell when you're in the right spot for each of our products. Now, the thing is, it changes week to week, season to season, because this is a wooden machine. I don't have a mark up here on the beam that says that's where grits I set, that's where flour I set. It can be different depending on humidity, weather conditions, time of year. So you have to really learn your machine. And that's actually, for a miller, one of the um, unique and interesting things about running these old machines. You, you have to get in tune with it. And then on the other side, there's a large stick, which I'm going to call a control shut, that allows me to open and close the water flow of the mill. So basically, you have to control feed, speed, and gap. And if you can calibrate all those, you're going to make good product. Now, I thought we'd walk back here briefly and take a little look at this end of the gear. Um, look down the gear pit here. You can see the back of the cogs and how they're pegged in. So everything that's been done in here is 18th century accurate. Mount Vernon prides itself on its reconstructions. And not only that, on its care of the mansion and the other buildings that are original. Quality restoration, quality care is what we're all about. And, you know, as we're in this time right now of, of hardship, if, if you're able to help Mount Vernon, uh, with, we have a lot of maintenance that's ongoing and, and, of course, taking care of things that need to be done. So we'd appreciate if, if you're able to, to donate to Mount Vernon in any way you can at this time. Um, now, the muscle for all of this is a large water wheel. So, again, water mills were just prevalent in Washington's time and, and throughout the colonial period and, all, and later. So this is our 16-foot water wheel. It generates 18 horsepower, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when that momentum of that wheel gets going, it can drive both stones at one time. And it also has other machinery on the upper floors that we use in processing flour and sifting flour. So it's quite amazing the amount of power one wheel can generate and if you've ever been in your own kitchen and ground by hand, imagine through the centuries before water mills and windmills came on, people had to grind in the villages just enough to feed that village. This mill can produce in a day 
anywhere, running 10, 12 hours a day, 4,000 to 6,000 pounds product. So for Washington, this mill really does two things. It, it makes export flour, makes, that's the cash into the business, but these stones over here, the country stones, crown everything else, and that fed the plantation. He would also grind for other local farmers. So if you live locally, you brought your corn here, by law, Washington's mill or any mill had to grind that for you. And what they would do is keep one sixth or one eighth of the weight of the grain as payment. So it was called toll milling or custom milling. And they would grind it to whatever finest you wanted. You would pick it up and take it home. So this mill has so many functions, but it was a vital, vital part of the estate. And um, for Washington, it really exemplifies a very wise business decision because had he remained in tobacco, his economic situation would have been very, very hard. So that's one thing if you, if you study him, you see that forward thinking. And you know, he's looking down the road. He's not thinking about just next season. He's thinking several years out. And the, and the grist mill served it well for many years. He had uh, three paid millers that worked here for a period of years for him. And also an enslaved miller named Ben that worked here for a number of years and he's even referenced in a letter that Washington writes that Ben knows the milling business very well. So it takes skill to do this. A lot of the trades at Mount Vernon, we, we replicate in the historic trades department. We've got a lot of talented people that can do everything from milling, distilling, to textiles, to cooking. And we hope when you all can come back, we can get back into some of those discussions and show you what was happening on the estate back in his time. Um, what I thought I'd do is run outside because I have to open up a water gate outside of the head gate, let some water through to get a little noisy in here. And I'll just run the mill for a couple minutes, minute and a half for you all. And then we can stop and talk and hopefully you'll have some questions for me and I'll be happy to answer those. So let me go ahead and uh, get the water flow going.
So what I just did there would have upset George Washington because once the mill started running, he expected it to run all day. Um, and that's how it happened back then. It was put in motion early in the morning. Sometimes ran into the night, just depending on what they needed to do. So, but I felt it was important to let me see it turn today. Help me out too, because I wanted to run it. But I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have about we, the mill or the farms. We do have quite a few. Thank you, Steve. And I think we're going to stay here. I think we are unfrozen now. So sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Adam. Would most of the flour have been sold or go to feed the family and the enslaved workers so they would be less dependent on foreign imports? The flour ground on the French stones, 90% of that was exported for profit, sometimes to Norfolk, Virginia, sometimes to the Caribbean or overseas markets. These stones here grinding the corn fed the plantation. So Cornmeal was part of weekly rations for everyone that lived and worked here, whether you were enslaved or free or indentured servant. So these stones are really the workhorse that feeds everyone that lives and works here. Great. Angela asked, how did Steve learn all of this knowledge? Good question. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. That started long ago um, after I got out of college with a history degree. I was fortunate to get a job at a county park that had a mill. And the miller liked me. And one day he said, would you like to learn how to run this? And I said, yeah. And that was three mills and 25 years ago. So uh, <laughs> it, I just, mills get in your blood. It's like a lot of things, people have passions. And I, I can't imagine not having a mill as part of my life. So I've been very fortunate to learn from other skilled people in an apprenticeship type of program. And Jeanette said, can you talk about the enslaved people who did the daily work at the mill? Yeah, as I mentioned Ben earlier, who was a skilled slave who ran the mill, but on this particular farm, the other key workers throughout the whole period were the enslaved coopers. Because flour is exported in, in barrels and casks. So near this building, we have it reconstructed, and we hope to one day, was a cooperage. And there were, depending on the year, anywhere from three to six coopers that were enslaved that were uh, making barrels for, for the mill, also for its fishing operation. And once the distillery is built next door, that needs barrels for whiskey. So the Coopers were critical and they were highly skilled men that lived and worked here on this farm. But they would also occasionally go down to Union Farm where the fish house was for the commercial fisheries and make barrels there. Um, so throughout the plantation, the work of the enslaved was critical to this whole place working and from the fields, but also to a number of skilled positions to include blacksmith as, as well. And Bill asked, what equipment is original from Washington's time to the mill? I wish I could say there was. Uh, sadly, in the 1840s, the Washington's mill was broken down. It was a, a group of Quake, Quakers had moved from Pennsylvania and bought this particular farm. And, and the mill was so broken down, they just dismantled it. And so what we have here is a very accurate reconstruction. But we have some old elements from that mill in the Shenandoah Valley that was moved here. Uh, when the state did the 1930s restoration. So this piece dates from probably 1820. Um, the bearing I showed you downstairs is from that earlier mill. And upstairs, we have a number of years that we kind of keep in the mill from the early restoration. But sadly, the mill was all gone, just like the distillery burnt down in 1814. So um, we're fortunate to have the gem of Mount Vernon, which is that mansion. So you know, we invite you to come back to see the original mansion and those outbuildings which state all from Washington's time. And Amanda asks, were there ever times of drought when the mill couldn't operate? Oh yeah, that's, that's throughout the record. You know, Dove Creek, Washington referred to as an indifferent stream. It's the best place you had for a water mill, but it didn't always supply enough water. So in summers, you know, being a farmer, he's a weather watcher. If you read his diary, he notes all the drought periods. So um, when it's no water, it doesn't run. So there's a, a great letter in one year, I think it's when he's president, the farm manager writes him and tells him that the drought's over. And so Washington has all this wheat that needs to get made into flour for the market. And so he writes the farm manager and says, tell the millers, this means nights. And so get the flour done. So when the water's back, he expected it to be running. The other thing this site suffers from is at the back end, we get high tides at the creek as well. So this morning when I came in, we had high tide and the wheel was sitting in water and I didn't know if I was gonna be able to turn for you today. But Washington's millers dealt with that as well because we're part of the title Chesapeake Bay and, and the water comes in and out. 
And Abigail asks, did Washington use the mill for his own needs or did he also share with neighbors? He shared in that he ground for local people. So it was a business transaction. As I said earlier, it was a, I'll grind your grain, you give me one eighth as payment. Or some local farmers might sell their whole wheat crop to this mill and Washington would store it and then mill it on his own schedule. Um, so this was really a business that fed Mount Vernon, but also could transact business with the local community. But in this county, in the 1780s, there were 30 mills. So people didn't go far with grain. There was usually one or two mills within five to six miles of you. And like any business, you decided which mill you preferred to go to. It was close. All right, Dave asks, can you explain the advantages of the Evans design? Yeah, we didn't go into that today. That was part of the upper part of the mill. Um, but in 1780s, late 1780s, a man named Oliver Evans invented the bucket elevator, which was a continuous belt with little scoops on it to transport grain up in a mill and flour up. And he also invented a cooling device to cool flour prior to sifting. In 1790, Evans files for a U.S. patent and George Washington's president. And as president, believe it or not, he had to sign approved patents, so he read it over and realized I think I need this at my mill. So he wrote to Oliver Evans, or actually Tobias Lear, his secretary did. And that letter exists in our archives. And he says, can you come to Mount Vernon and install this new system? And what Evans had really invented was a way to move grain through the mill automatically without human hands having to handle it. And we have all of that on the wheat side of this mill. And we run it certain times a year and for certain special programs. So we did a complete copy of what's in Evans' book from the 1790s. And I believe there's probably some videos on our mountvernon.org that show the Evans system working. But it's interesting, Evans holds U.S. patent number three for the automated flour mill system. All right. And Laura asks, besides corn, what other grain was milled there? Well, they milled oats, barley, rye, spelt, which we're thinking about doing in the future. Uh, Washington also had a variety, seven or eight or to ten different wheats that he used for export flour. Uh, corn was the second biggest crop at Mount Vernon, so that's ground the majority of the time. Oats for livestock feed. Late 1790s, rye, because that building next door that we'll talk about later in the month uh, needed a lot of rye for the whiskey. And Angela asked, is the corn heirloom from Washington's day? No, that's a great question. What we're doing now is grinding a corn that comes from a farm that grows for other food processors. It's a Virginia farm, so it's high quality, but modern varietal. However, this last year, working with the folks at Anson Mills, South Carolina, and with a good friend of ours, a library fellow, uh, Justin Sherry, he's a chef and 18th century baker. We ground some heirloom wheats last spring, which Justin used uh, baking in, in his period of it. So our plan in the future is once we get back rolling is to, to start to offer some heirloom flowers and corns for sale through our retail shop. And we look forward to doing that just to get as close to Washington's time with grain as we possibly can. And Cynthia said, you might have spoken about this, but how many turns of the wheel are there per operating day? And how much water is used slash generated slash needed per day for one's for one day's operation? It's hard to calculate that <laughs> for one day, but what I can tell you is about seven to eight rotations of that water wheel depending on how close the stones are, what grain you're grinding, will turn this top stone 90 to 120 revolutions per minute. So without a large water source, you know, the mill can't make it. So in Washington's day, that mill pond he had ended up being not sufficient. So at some point, I forget the date, he ends up turning, creating a second dam and turning the Piney Branch, another creek here, into his mill race for extra water. So Throughout Virginia, in this region, um, they're running off creeks and ponds. And uh, where I used to work uh, down in the Tidewater, I was fortunate to run a mill that had its original nine-acre mill pond behind it that was spring-fed. And so in that mill, I never ran out of water. So the topography and the lay of the land really dictates in many ways how successful the mill can be. But sorry I can't run a daily calculation. Let me just say you need a lot of water to make this thing run. Makes sense. And Renee asks, how long would the flour last without spoiling? That's a good question. That's actually something that the Germans in the 19th century couldn't figure out, but that's another story. But how does American flour make it from our shores to Portugal 
to Southern Europe, to South America. That one shipment from this mill in Washington's time went to Italy. And they receive it and it's high quality and it doesn't spoil. Well, a lot of it ties into some of what Oliver Evans was talking about, but the flour has to be ground and, and put in a barrel in proper weather conditions. If it's a humid day and you pack up that flour and the moisture is in there, it's not gonna make it. So the cooling device that he invented, the hopper boy, which is on the fourth floor, that's part of its job is to spread and cool that flour before it's sifted. So it's conditioned in a sense so that it can be packaged properly. But if they had a really bad heat wave, they would be very careful about when they sealed those casts up. And through proper handling of the, of the flour, they were able to get it there. Now, it doesn't mean that every miller was that diligent. You know, uh, we, we know that there's a range of effort among people in various jobs, and you can read stories about mills that didn't do well because somebody didn't take care. But I think uh, we know from the records here that this bill was very well-minded. And Stephen said, how much acreage is associated with the grist mill? Um, oh, he said, FYI, graduate of MV High School. Oh, gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm glad you're a local guy here. Um, here, I think we own about, I want to say, 9 to 12 acres along Stream Valley, some of it on the other side of the road. In Washington's time, where the mill is, it was actually a lot of this was part of the original 2100 Mount Vernon tract, 2100 acres. But Washington did buy up a lot of land. There was a lot of landowners above the mill. And over a period of years of the 1750s, 60s, and 70s, he acquires what would become Dove Run through various purchases. So um, now I didn't mention that Washington inherited a mill. Uh, we didn't get into that. But up on this creek, if you drive this area, the young person that went to Mount Vernon High knows Old Mill Road. That refers to the earlier Washington mill uh, that probably had about 190 acres with it that was up on the creek a little further uh, that direction. And Dave asks, as the stones wear during grinding, is the fine stone flour getting added to the wheat flour? No, if you're doing your job right. Now, <laughs> you, you can get a particle because a stone will sometimes chip. But really, when the mill's running, it's one of the things about setting the gap is you do not want those stones to get too tight. And it only happens when we're making a very fine product that you worry about that. But if they are rubbing, even though there's grain between them, you will smell, I like to use the analogy of a cap gun. If you've ever had a cap gun when you were a kid, that, that burnt smell will be evident right away. And that tells the miller to raise that stone with the lever a little bit to adjust the gap. Uh, otherwise you will get bits of stone in there. Um, but if the miller's mindful of his work, it shouldn't happen unless you have something fracturing on the stone or chipping. Now, after we dress the stones with that pick, I learned a long time ago milling, it's a good idea to run 50 to 100 pounds of corn through that stone, take the stones apart, clean it all out, and that kind of conditions the stone. So if there's any particles or bits that your pick loosened up, you've taken care of that before you make product. Um, but uh, there's no doubt cases of that that happens. It happened to me once on a trip in Germany. A German friend worked at the windmill and we got in the car to take a trip and he says, he made sandwiches for lunch. He says, be very careful. There's a new man at the windmill. And every so often you'd bite your sandwich, you'd fill a granular part of the millstone. So, you know, it can happen, but again, it's part of running your mill properly. You want to be very careful about that. David asked, what happened to the mill after Washington's death? Did it continue? His nephew, Lawrence Lewis, uh, who married Nellie Custis, Martha's granddaughter, they inherited Dobe Run Farm. And so they took over the milling and distilling businesses. And it ran for a few more years. Um, and then the distillery burned in 1814, the mill carried on, but at some point it becomes a broken down machine. So it lived on for a little longer, but really a lot of things after Washington died, Mount Vernon was never the same property. It got divided in thirds and uh, the type of management Washington brought to it in his lifetime just wasn't there. So they lingered a little longer, but never, never as uh, well as when Washington was alive. And we have a question, oh, from a preschool. How did Washington keep track of his grain production and business transactions? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Washington expected meticulous records to be kept at the mill by the farm manager. And so all the grain that came from each farm went into a ledger and it noted how many bushels and what farm it came from. And then the miller had to keep track of all that too when it brought here. And then he had to know how much was produced of each product. 
And in the farm report that George Washington received, you can see mill reports and it'll give all these details. And for the flour that was sent overseas, he wanted to know how many barrels of mill of flour were ready to be shipped in the mill. And you can see that all that is still surviving today. So it's all about good record keeping. Excellent. And we just have time for a couple more questions. Um, Angela asked, was the building shell still there after it was gutted or was the building destroyed as well? The building was destroyed. Actually, it was actually dismantled in the, in the parts, the stones sold for other construction in the area. So we know of two houses and a barn that have original stone. They're gone now, sadly, but had original stone from the distillery in Wisconsin in them. So it was really, they just sold it out and sold the parts. All right, and our last question from David, what are some of the sayings we have in our language today that originate from millers? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, well, I talked earlier about the millstone gap. Mm -hmm. And if you smell burning, you've all heard the phrase, keep your nose to the grindstone. <laughs> so we don't know if that's where it originated, but you know, you, your sense of smell tells you what's happening with the stones. The other one is grind to a halt. If you overfeed the grain into the stone, even though that wheel's got water coming over, you could choke that stone and it'll stop and you have all that pressure on the machinery. So, and actually in windmills, that's one way that in an emergency, they sometimes can stop the mill if you can't get, windmills have brakes. But if you can't get to the brake and something bro you know, breaks down with the machinery, they can dump the shoe and overfeed the stone and choke it and stop the mill. So grind to a halt is another one. Uh, rule of, you know, the Miller's thumb, Dusty Miller, which is, <laughs> you know, if you see Corey when we're grinding rye for whiskey, he looks like, yeah, he looks like he's about 85 years old sometimes. But thank you all. And again, uh, we really appreciate you all's support with these live streams. If you, if you have the ability to help Mount Vernon during this time, we really hope you'll donate. And please check out the mill products online. They're, they're high quality and I think you'll enjoy them. And later in May, we're gonna talk about a building that happens to be behind the mill and with an update on some of the spirits that we're making there uh, at George Washington's distillery. So I hope you'll tune back in. A lot of interesting things to talk about what's been going on. So thanks for tuning in and thanks to all of you for your support.